Let's go ahead and go to John chapter 16. So, picking up where we left off two weeks ago in John chapter 16, and just kind of a reminder of where we ended last week. The thought here, it kind of, or two weeks ago, it kind of picks up, uh, or it's continuing a thought, but Jesus, at the end of chapter 15, he warns them and he tells them they're going to be hated. He warns them about that. Uh, you know, they hated him without a cause. They were going to hate. They were going to hate the disciples too. But he tells them about a comforter who's going to come, the Holy Spirit. We all know. Uh, we all know about that. And so, in chapter 16, he's kind of continuing this thought here. And I believe that we. One of the things I want you to watch for in here. One of the things that we see. Uh, really, a huge. Uh, you can say it's a huge revelation, even though uh, Jesus, they did, the disciples didn't completely understand it here. Jesus is about to teach them here in John chapter 16, I believe, a new doctrine, one that they were not familiar with, that just happens to be one of our Baptist distinctives. And so, uh, just kind of watch for that as we go through John chapter 16. But look at verse 1. And it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. So he's telling them this on purpose. I'm telling you this because I don't want you to be offended. All right? This isn't good news. Okay? None of us like you know to get bad news, but yet... Uh, if we're all expecting sunshine and roses in life and then trials come, it's going to cause us to be offended. And trials are going to come. And so Jesus said, I'm just going to warn you, this is what's going to happen. That way, when that time comes, we're not going to be shocked about it. And something I want us to make sure we understand when we're reading this passage, uh, you know, but Jesus, you know, he's warning them in this passage about things to come. And most of these things are bad. And sometimes, you know, serving God, it involves trials that's just part of life it involves tribulations and we shouldn't be surprised when these things happen and so as we read through this chapter there's two things you need to make sure you understand is that in this chapter the things that jesus is talking about he is speaking directly to his disciples these were uh he's speaking directly to them and these things that he is saying applied directly to them okay now, one of the things dispensationalists do a lot of times is they will accuse us of, you know, taking things that aren't for us and misusing them. But, uh, and, and listen, you know, there's, you can understand, you know, application and context without dispensationalism. You know, there's just some common sense that we see. You know, if you see a verse in the Bible that says not to eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden... Okay, that's not talking about a tree that's in the midst of your garden. Okay, that was talking about a specific tree in the midst of the Garden of Eden. All right, that doesn't mean what if you have a garden, you got a tree in the middle of it, you're never allowed to eat that. Okay, yeah, that is not rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, and so, and there are things that we're going to, I'll probably touch on some of these as we go through this chapter, but a lot of times we will, uh, people will take some of these verses and apply them directly to us. And it, it makes it easy for a dispensationalist to come along and say, nope, y'all are misusing that. He's speaking directly to the disciples there. But, I, you know, these, these things that people often use and apply directly to us, you'll see them other places in the Bible too, where it is directly talking about us. So you can have both sometimes. While, yes, Jesus is talking to his disciples here, there's no doubt about that. He's talking about a specific time that the disciples were going to go through, we, these things, we can still learn from them and they do still have application for us. And so I, I want you to watch for some of that as we go through this. So he is, he's telling them, you know, here's some things that are going to come. I'm telling you this so you won't be offended. I mean, at times, come, you're going to be put out of the synagogues. Now, has anybody in here ever been put out of a synagogue? Okay. Well, no, because no, I've never even been in a synagogue before. Okay. <laughs> But I've been put out of a camp before, you know, I've been put out of an association or a fellowship, you know, for preaching the truth on something. So, yes, this passage here, it's, you know, it's talking directly to disciples. They were the ones that are going to be put out of synagogues. But y'all understand if we keep preaching the truth and do the right thing, we're going to get put out of some things, too. 
we're going to get put out of some churches. You know, I mean, there's, it's just, it's just how it is. And so it's okay for me to take this verse and learn from it and apply some of these things. I'm not misusing the scripture. It doesn't mean I'm not rightly dividing the word of truth. It is, I'm, I'm learning from principle in this. And so, you know, none of you will probably ever be put out of a synagogue unless you convert to Judaism for a while. And then you start, you know, talking like a Christian, they'll probably put you out of a synagogue then. But if you get put out of a church or a, a, you know, a religion because of truth, I think you can say, yeah, I'm going through the very thing the disciples went through that Jesus warned them they were going to go through. If they did that to the disciples, they'll probably do it to me too. It's okay. That is okay for you to apply the scriptures in that way. That's not inappropriate at all. And so, cause look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay? Now that verse there, I mean, even a dispensationalist would agree, that's talking to us. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That goes right along with what Jesus was warning the disciples of there in those first few verses. So if you hear a preacher get up and he wants to preach a message on coming persecution and being put out of people's company and he uses that scripture, that is not inappropriate for him to do that. Okay? But this isn't just a thing for the future either. It was directly talking about them and the, those very disciples, those very things happened to them. And so just like Jesus said, and so we, but we were, we were told basically the same thing. And so look at verse four, it says, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said, not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So Jesus, you know, he, he said, when this starts to come to pass, okay, a lot of times when bad things happen to people, they start kind of losing faith. What's going on? Doesn't God keep his promises? Why is this happening to me? Well, if you'd be in the Bible like you were supposed to, then you would remember that, you know what? He warned us that hard times are going to come. You know, the Holy Spirit will remind, you know, will maybe point you to a scripture and say, you know, where, where'd you read that verse in the Bible where it says everything sunshine and roses for a Christian? It'll remind you of the verse that says, yea, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, he'll remind you of verses say, and we know that all things work to get together for good to them who love God. Not all things work out good. No, they work together for good. There's going to be some bad stuff mixed in there. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit will remind us of those things and then we won't be offended when those things are happening. And, you know, and I, I get aggravated sometimes when people start getting discouraged because of how wicked this world's getting, you know, because of how crazy churches are getting, because of all the false doctrine creeping into church. And people, they do, they start losing faith. You know, is something wrong? I mean, are we wrong? I mean, everybody's preaching this false doctrine. You know, I know the Bible says this, but everybody's preaching this. Well, wait, didn't the Bible say, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse? Deceiving and being deceived? Isn't that exactly what the Bible said was going to happen? So while, yes, it's disappointing for me when I hear about people buying into false doctrine and when I hear about some of the crazy things that are being taught in fundamental Baptist churches, you know, I'm sad by that. But honestly, it just fires me up even more. Hey, that's just God's word coming to pass again. And you know what? I don't have to go along with that. The Bible throughout the, you know, Revelation chapter two and three, it says to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, you know, while everybody else is doing this, we don't have to do that. We can do the right thing. We can overcome. And so Jesus wanted them to be able to comfort themselves with his word when these time came. So we've been warned. There's no excuse for us to lose faith just because things are going bad. First Peter chapter four, verse 12 says, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So we see here that, you know, the Bible tells us, hey, don't, when, when you're going through these trials, don't act like it's a strange thing. You were told this was going to happen. You're partaking in the sufferings of Christ. You know what he said? You know, he said, rejoice. Or um, he said, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ. You realize people who 
believe like we do, we're constantly the ones that are being accused of being evil, being the bad guys. They accuse us of bringing reproach on the name of Christ for preaching the very things that are from the word of God. And the Bible said, and you know, when that happens, what do most people do? They back down. They back down. They, they cower. But the Bible said we should rejoice when that happens. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. This is exactly what happened to the disciples. So when we see these things happening, we shouldn't get discouraged. It ought to tell us, hey, we're on the right track. When the attacks come, you know what? I just, we, must be, we must be doing something. We must be making a difference. You know, nobody's attacking them. You know, when was the last time you heard about a major attack on, a meth, on the Methodists? Well, when was the last time they did that? When was the last time a Methodist preacher was on the news for doing something controversial? You know, unless it's like some sex scandal or something like that. You know, you don't, you don't hear about that. They don't get attacked for anything. You know, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians. If you hear about those people, it's because they finally evolved and are, you know, ordaining women ministers and, you know, homosexual ministers and, and, you know, and they'll get praised for that. I watched a big thing one time about all these preachers that are teaching now that there's no hell. And, you know, they got a lot of attention, but they were made to look great. But you know what? You hear about Baptists quite often. Their name's getting run through the mud in the news media. Why? Because that's the ones the devil's going to attack, the ones that are making a difference. You're not going to hear him going after Pastor Trendy in his pink shirt. He's not going to waste his time going after those guys. He's, you know, the devil's going to go after those who are preaching the truth. And you know what? If he sends some persecution our way, listen, I'm not asking for it. Okay? I'm not inviting you know, the queers to come protest or anything like that. But you know, if that happens to this church... That is not the time for us to go suck our thumb in a corner and feel sorry for ourselves and wonder, Lord, what's going on? You know, because where in the Bible did it say that we, if if we would be like Christ, we would be popular and everyone would love us? It's not in the Bible. The complete opposite is said. We ought to be scared when everybody's loving us. You know, when we become the most popular thing in town, that's when we better maybe scratch our head a little bit and say, hey, are we on the right track here? You know, is this revival or have we compromised? You know, and uh, most of the time, if you become popular, it's because of it's because of compromise. So, uh, you know, we need to we ought to take comfort when those difficulties come. But look at the last part of verse four. He said, "These things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you." You know, one thing we need to realize is that we don't need to know everything that's to come. We just need to trust Jesus day by day. Jesus, when he called Peter, you know, if history is true that Peter was crucified upside down, you know, when Jesus asked Peter to follow him, he didn't say, Peter, you know, follow me and I'll make you fish as a man. And oh, by the way, you're going to do a lot of suffering. You're going to get crucified upside down. He, he didn't tell him about those things. Well, shouldn't he have let him know about that? You know, shouldn't he have warned him of what was to come right at the beginning? no. He didn't need to know that. We don't need to know everything that's out there ahead of us. Listen, there might be horrible things out there for you. You know, there might be cancer, death in the family. I mean, I, I don't know. And you know what? We don't need to know. You know what we need to do? We just need to trust Jesus day by day. You know what Peter needed to do when Jesus said, follow me? He, should, he just needed to follow, follow Jesus. He just needed to know what God's will was that day. And you know what? In the beginning when Jesus would have called Peter... If he'd have said, follow me, and if you follow me, you will eventually die for it. Peter probably would have said, I'm going back to fishing. It's a lot safer. But you realize that if you could talk to Peter today, he has no regrets. He, even when he, the time came for him to die, I guarantee you, he wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. But back then he would have. So you know what? It's a good thing Jesus didn't tell him what was going to come. Because otherwise, he would have missed out on a lot of heavenly blessings. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, God gives us what we're able to handle at that time. And that's why we just need to trust him. We don't need to know everything that's ahead of us. And people do. They always, you know, how am I going to do this? How am I, you know, how, if, I, if I serve God or if I go into the ministry, how am I going to support my family? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? You know what? Just trust God day by day. What's God's will for you to do today? Do that. He doesn't need to, he doesn't need to answer all those things for you. You just need to trust him. Just do what he says to do. And Jesus, he didn't tell him, he didn't tell him about those things that were, that were to come. He didn't need to. He was right there with him. 
But, but wait a minute, you know, what about us now? Jesus isn't with us now. Well, not in the flesh. But do you all understand these days that he was talking about? There was going to be a period of time where he, they were going to be without him or without the Holy Spirit, without the Comforter. Because the Comforter, comforter came later, didn't it? On the day of Pentecost. And so he was warning them about a very specific time. Okay, While Jesus isn't with us in the flesh today, we have the Holy Spirit, don't we? He's with us. He said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And so we don't need to know everything in the future because we have the Holy Spirit with us and he'll guide us day by day. And that's what we need. And, that, and so um, when bad things come, if tomorrow it's a bad day, you know what you need, just need to do? You just need to trust, trust Christ. Just and let him get you through the next day. Don't be like, why didn't you tell me this was going to come? Hey, he told us bad times are going to come. He didn't get specific on what they are, but we do need to trust him. So look at verse five. It says, but now I go my way to him that sent me and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Now I, I like this here because you know when it comes to bad things that we've been promised, we have a natural tendency to ignore those things, don't we? You know, everybody loves the verses about heaven. We know those verses. We'll memorize those verses. But you know, how often do you memorize verses about persecution, about tribulation? You know, when you were a kid in Sunday school, you know, they would teach you things like the Lord is my shepherd, you know, Psalm 23. You know, they would teach you the verses about heaven and things like that. But you know, how often did you memorize the ones about, you ain't all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? You know, how often did you memorize verses from John chapter 16? You know, where it's talking about all these bad things that are come your way. And the, one of the reasons, too, I think this is one of the reasons, too, Christians are basically ignorant today about the coming tribulation. Who wants to hear about that? See, Jesus, he's, he's told them, he says, but now I go my way to him that sent me, but none of, and none of you ask of me, whither goest thou? Jesus, is, he told them he's going to go away, but nobody's asking about that. Because, wait, I don't like the sound of that. I don't, I don't want to hear about that. And don't we do that with a lot of things in the Bible? When it's stuff that we like, boy, we'll zoom in on that. We'll pay attention to that. If, it's, if we're reading something and it's about somebody else's sin, oh man, we'll get all into that. We'll memorize that. But when it's something that's about our own sin, we just graze over that, don't we? We just skip over that. We don't meditate on it. We don't think about it. When the Bible talks about bad things that are to come, we just we don't want to hear about those things. And you know, preaching from stuff like this, preaching about being hated, that is not a popular subject. That is not what people would like to hear about. But you know what? We need to know this. People need to know what's coming. Somebody needs to warn them. Jesus warned his disciples. And your pastors need to warn the people in their churches. We, you know, we, need to warn, we need to warn people about what's to come. But it's hard because people don't want to talk about that. They don't ask you questions about those things. And the disciples, they didn't ask Jesus about this. And so I think this is why so many Christians are ignorant about the coming tribulation. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the mark of the beast. I don't want to think about being martyred. Well, you need to think about those things. You know, you think because you live in America and God's blessed us and we're safe here that you're never going to have to worry about those things. But folks, we don't know how much things can change in a year or a month. I mean, one, one catastrophic event can change everything. And that's why we need to be ready. We need to be tribulation preppers. Brother Mark talked about last, last week. You know, we got to get ourselves ready spiritually right now. You can't wait until then to do these things. And so... Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So while hard times were ahead, Jesus is saying better days are coming. Hey, this is gonna, this is, you're not going to like it when I leave you. But listen, because I'm leaving you, I'm going to be able to send the Comforter. Because I'm leaving, something better is is coming. And you know what? The tribulation, you know, to me, I think it is exciting. Okay, and we get we get hammered all the time, all oh, you people, you're not looking for Jesus, you're looking for the antichrist. You know, you're looking for tribulation, I'm looking for heaven. 
you're looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. You know, that's a big line they like to, they like to use. But listen, you know, Jesus, when he, when he talks about his coming, you know, he warned us there's some things coming first. Okay? Now listen, I'm looking forward to the coming of Christ. Therefore, I'm going to pay attention when the Bible says there's other things that are going to come first. It's not that I want those things to happen. It's just, I know what's coming after that. And you know what? That's what will help us get through that time. I mean, folks, I don't know when or if or we're going to know for sure when it's all going down. I think we probably will. But good night, folks. Can you imagine knowing for sure that we're just about done? I'll, that just excites the fire out of me. I mean, that, that really does. And so I'm looking for those things, not because, man, I just love the thought of being on the run. I just love the thought of getting my head cut off. But, man, I love the thought of the rapture. I love the thought of being in heaven. And so, you know what? You know, I, I am, I'm looking for the upper taker too. All right. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. And, you know, it's like, you know, kids, it's not going to be long. They're going to be counting down to Christmas, you know, looking forward to Christmas. But you know what? Halloween comes before Christmas. And, and just be, you know, and so, you know, we know that's got to come first. doesn't mean we're excited about Halloween. We know it comes after that, you know, and that's what we're focused on. That's what we're interested in. And so, uh, you know, I, I think verse seven, it, there's a great principle there that, you know, just, yeah, bad things are times are coming, but something better comes after that. And we're going to see another example of that here in a little in a little bit. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But what verse eight says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And I like this because the Holy Spirit, he, when he comes, he has a very specific mission. Okay. Jesus had a very specific mission, didn't he? His mission was to come and to pay for the sins of the whole world. And he did exactly that. He fulfilled his mission. He fulfilled his role. He died. He rose again. He ascended to the father. He sent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit he did three things. He's going to reprove the world of sin. He's going to reprove. He's going to, he was the Holy Spirit shows us that we're sinners. The Holy Spirit shows us that we need to repent. But what do we need to repent of? People say repent of your sin. But notice it says, notice it's, it's very specific. I mean, this is just, it, this is so clear. It's not even funny. He says he's going to reprove the world of sin. And what sin? Of sin because they believe not on me. Okay, that's this. I mean, all sin, any sin is a transgression of the law. But the one sin that you do have to repent of in order to be saved is that sin of unbelief. You have that's you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one sin that you must repent of. And it's interesting that that's the one that it mentions is going to reprove the world of sin. What sin? Well, you know, fornication, at least, you know, uh, you know, lack of church attendance, you know, they'll, they'll name all these things that church, you know, other Christians like, no, you at least got to do these works. But it's funny. The only one that it mentions is the sin because they believe not on me. And so that makes, I mean, right there, that makes it really clear what, uh, repentance is reproving the world of sin is repenting. uh, You know, if the Bible never says repent of your sins or repent of your sin, you don't see that phrase in the Bible. But I think that's about as close as you can get to that phrase in the Bible. And it's very clear that it's the sin of unbelief. Therefore, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved is still true. Uh, despite what the repent of your sins crowd uh, tries to tell us on that. So he's going to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, because I go to the Father and ye see me no more. Now, this is, that's interesting too. So he's going to reprove the world of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Who is the righteous? It's Jesus Christ. Who is the absolute standard of righteousness? It's Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, we can't see Jesus Christ in the flesh today. So, you know, what is another standard of righteousness that we can look at? Well, it's the Word of God that Jesus Christ Himself fulfilled. Well, Jesus Christ is not on earth anymore. And so the Holy Spirit... 
He reproves the world. He shows, he proves what righteousness is by the word of God. He point, the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus Christ through the word of God, through the preaching of the word of God that comes from us. The Holy Spirit does that. And that's what we do when we go out soul winning. What we're doing is we're reproving the world. We're showing the world. We're proving what is righteous. And that is Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? We do that from the word of God. We preach the word of God to them. We preach Jesus to them. And the Holy Spirit, he's going to reprove them. He's going to, he's going to try to get them to turn from that sin of unbelief and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in his righteousness, not their righteousness. That is what the Holy Spirit does. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he's going to, uh, he, it mentions of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Jesus is going to be the one who judges the world. Jesus Christ is going to do that. He's the one who's going to come back one of these days and he's going to judge the world. He is going to rule this world with a rod of iron. It's going to be Jesus Christ that returns at the battle of Armageddon and smites the nations. It's Jesus that's going to do all that. Jesus is the judge, the, the righteous judge that we're going to stand before at the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that, that the dead are going to stand before at the great white throne of judgment. And so the Holy Spirit, what is he doing right now? He, his, his job, and he does this through us, us is to reprove the world of sin, get them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, of righteousness. He points to Jesus Christ. He is the standard of righteousness. He point, he reminds people that Jesus Christ, who is righteous is going to come back and he is going to judge this world and he is going to rule and reign in righteousness. That is the mission of the Holy spirit. And he uses us to carry out those things. And we've got to talk about all three of those things. We've got, there's some churches out there today they like talking about the righteousness of Jesus. They'll talk about the righteousness of Jesus all day long. But they don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about why people aren't righteous. And they don't want to talk about coming judgment. They don't want to talk about hell. They don't want, you know, it is, you, can, you can go to any trendy church and you can preach of the righteousness of Jesus all day long. And nobody will get mad at you as long as you don't start talking about sin. And as long as you don't talk about coming judgment, but we've got to talk about all three of those things. You can't leave any of them out. People need to understand that you got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. That it's his righteousness that will get you into heaven, not your righteousness. And he is coming back and he's going to judge this world. He is the judge. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. That is the mission of the Holy Spirit. So verse 12 says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever ye shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you all things that the father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So Jesus, we see here, he couldn't share everything. He had because they didn't have everything they needed to understand yet. There was, he, he's telling them there's some things to come, but the Holy Spirit's going to show these things to you. I'm not showing you these things yet. You know, you cannot bear them now. You're not ready for things, th these things right now. And you know what they needed at the time and what we need all the time is just to put our faith and trust in Jesus. That was what they needed to do right then. You know, they needed to do that day and in those next days that were so crucial, they just needed to trust him. Just trust his word. What does he want me to do today? That's what they needed to focus on. What do we need right now? We don't need to know every little thing about the future. What we do need to do is we need to just, we need to trust him. Whatever his word says to do, that's what we're going to do. Well, I don't get that. I don't understand that. We well, you know do it anyway. Just trust him. Follow him, you know, keep his commandments, do what he says. That's what we need to do right now. And, you know, God's word, it has everything that we need to know in it. Everything we need to know is in God's word. You know, we don't need, we don't need to look at anything outside the Bible. I'm not saying you can't ever read other books, but you all understand that, you know, uh, any, whatever book you, you read out there, it's flawed. It's not the word of God. And I'm fine with people writing books about the Word of God, trying to help people understand things. But you got to understand that everything you need to know is in the Word of God. And that's what you need to trust. 
And so, you know, a lot of times people, they start wanting answers for things that, you know what, maybe God didn't want us to know those things. You know, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, of any value for us to obsess over what's going to happen in the new heaven and new earth. You know, that's a long way off. And, you know, while it's okay to study that, find out what the Bible shows us in the end, there's not a ton there. And so, you know, don't go trying to find some other book somewhere that somebody wrote to help you figure all that out. You know, we've got a lot of people today, even Baptists, for some reason, they think it's safe, you know, getting, you know, reading from Jews and, you know, re, you know trying to learn things from the Talmud and all, oh, you know, these are Jews. You know, they know that Old Testament so well. They can help us understand the Old Testament. Really? Because Jesus said they didn't even believe the Old Testament. And so why would we think they would help us understand the Old Testament better? We understand the Old Testament better than they do. I don't care how smart they look. Okay. We know the Old Testament better than they do. Jesus prove that himself. He said they don't even believe it. So that's just foolish. And people do that. And they'll go to these extra biblical sources for things. And that is foolish to do that. I'm not saying you can never read those things. But I am saying don't ever let anything in there overrule what the Bible says. And don't go there looking for something to help you, you know, if, if that where the Bible, you know, is silent. Just, you know, don't just don't even pay attention to it. It's just going to get you in trouble. And so uh, look at verse 16. It says, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Now, Jesus starts using some tricky wording here. Then said some of the, his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while and ye shall not see me and again a little while and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So Jesus, he, he makes this confusing statement. And, but basically when he's saying, a little while and ye shall not see me, I believe that's referring to the fact that he was going to die. He wasn't going to be with them anymore. But then he says, a little while and ye shall see me. I think he's saying, I'm going to come back from the dead. You're going to see me again after that. Okay, now that's real easy for us to look back and say that's what he was talking about. But put yourself in their place. That was tough. All right, that was a tough saying. Why did he say it like that? And I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, you know, while no doubt the disciples were traumatized by the death of Christ, didn't sorrow quickly leave after the resurrection? I mean, just imagine what it was like for them those three days when Jesus was dead. They're pretty much in hiding, thinking, we're next. We are next. It's just a matter of time, and we're dead as a doornail. And we're going to find out who's right, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Is there an afterlife or is there no afterlife? You know, I mean, I mean, they're scared to death, but just imagine what it must have been like for them after Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, I, that had to have been just the most amazing thing because... To me, I would think after Jesus rose from the dead like that, why would you be scared of death anymore? I mean, if man, their Savior conquered death. He was the one they're following. So guess what? If we get killed, it's obviously because God wanted, wants us to get killed. And if He doesn't want us to stay dead, we're not going to stay dead. And that's why it's foolish for us. I mean, we, you, know, you, you look at that story and think, man, those disciples, they should, you know, that must have been so exciting. You know, the boldness that it gave them after seeing the resurrected Lord. I mean, yeah, they didn't fear anything. It was clear they didn't fear death. The Apostle Paul himself, I mean, it was very clear he didn't fear death. These, they didn't care about it one bit. Why? Because they knew they served a risen Savior and they knew he had power over death. And therefore, they knew if I die, it's because Jesus wants me to die. And you know what? If I die, if he wants to bring me back, he can bring me back. And you know what? He's going to bring us back. What difference is if he raises us from the dead, you know, three days later or a thousand years from now? 
Either way, we're coming back from the dead, folks. So you know what? I mean, we have no, there is no excuse for us to be scared of this. You know, these pre-tribbers that, you know, get all down on us. Oh, you're taking away my blessed hope. Why are you so scared of death? Why is that such a problem for you? Are you that big of a coward? You know, do you not understand that our Lord has power over death? And you know what? Either way, you're going to die. Either way, you're going to go one way or the other. And, you know, you might die of a car wreck. Some of us in here, we might die of a car wreck eventually. Does that mean we don't have a blessed hope? No, I mean, either, if I do die in a car wreck, I'm going to rise from the dead later. Because our Lord conquered death. And so, I mean, that, that you know, pain they went through those three days, I mean, I just, they probably didn't even feel it anymore after the resurrection. And notice what Jesus compared it to, a woman in travail. A woman that's about to give birth to a baby. I've given, I've, I've given this illustration before. My wife, she, whenever she's pregnant, she's always excited about having the baby. Which to me, it's like, are you crazy? It's painful. It hurts really bad. But you know what? It's not that they're looking forward to the tribulation of childbearing. They're looking forward to what comes from that tribulation, and that's a child. And so, you know, it, for people to be down on us because we're looking for the tribulation... It would be like being down on a woman when she starts, you know, timing her contractions. You know, you're sick for doing that. You know, how dare you, you know, be paying attention and, and you know, keeping time on pain. Because, I, you know, after it gets within so many minutes, that usually means you're about to have that baby. And so they know, don't they? They know by those things, by those signs, by those travail, by those birth pains, that they know that they're about to go through a really horrible time. They're about to go through delivery. They're about to go through great tribulation. But it's going to produce a baby. So they don't care. They look forward to all of it. And it's the same thing for us. When we start seeing certain things happen, things that are bad, things that are painful, well, we're just going to get excited about it because we know what comes after that. And so Jesus right there, he's explaining it to him. Yeah, you're going to go through a really painful time those three days. But guess what? I'm going to make up for it when I rise from the dead. And so that's what he's talking about right there. You know, their sorrow, he's like you're weeping and lament now, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And that's what happens when a woman has a baby. She goes from screaming and yelling to, oh, I mean, in seconds. It's weird. I'm always still traumatized and huffing and puffing like, you know, you know, and, you know, and then she's there, oh, you know, this is just so great. And it's like, you know, it, it takes me a while, but women, they do. They go from screaming in agony to, oh, in seconds. And that's what's going to happen in tribulation. We're going to be going through some horrible times, but then we're going to be going to rejoicing before the throne of God in the twinkling of an eye. So I'm not worried about that stuff, folks. And we, you shouldn't be either. Jesus warned us about these things. When it ha- Those of us who are prepared, we're not going to be offended. And this is why you know, this kind of teaching needs to get out there because there's going to be a lot of people getting offended during that time because people, you know, they're, they're not being taught the truth about this. And listen, when the most exciting time in the history of humanity is about to happen, you know, we ought to let people in on it. We ought to let them know about it so they can actually enjoy it instead of being offended and fainting. But I'm going to do my part on that. I'm trying. I'm trying to help. So you, you all have been warned. This isn't anything to fear. So, uh, you know, I think this is why the disciples didn't fear death. Why would they fear death when they saw Jesus rise from the dead three days later? They knew he had power over death. And so they knew that, you know what, there's no place the devil or this world can take me. Jesus can't get me out of there's no grave they can put me in that can hold me in there. And so they, they didn't fear those things. But boy, we, preachers today, they fear a negative comment on Facebook. You know, I mean, they, do, they fear an ugly phone call from another preacher. You know, they fear not being asked to speak at the next big conference. That's the attitude of preachers today. And folks, that is pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. And uh, the disciples, you know, I think they'd be ashamed. I think Jesus is ashamed. We shouldn't worry about stuff like that. So look at verse 23. Um, it says, 
And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, right here is where I believe we're seeing a new doctrine introduced that they weren't familiar with before. There was pictures of it in the Old Testament, but this is a new thing. Now, this is one the charismatics, the name it, claim it, the prosperity gospel people, they'll try to use this passage, you know, just, you know, in the name of Jesus, I want the Corvette. You know, in the name of Jesus, I want the, all my bills paid for. And they use it for all these just, you know, carnal, greedy purposes. But listen, what Jesus was trying to show them here, I believe he is introducing them to one of our Baptist distinctives, and that is the priesthood of the believer. This is something that was new to them before, you know, when they were going to do their sacrifices or whatever, give their offerings. They had to use a priest, didn't they? For the, you know, they didn't have that direct access to God. It was only the high priest that could go into the Holy of Holies, wasn't it? You know, the ordinary man couldn't do that. The ordinary Jew did not have that direct access to God. They had to go through a priest that was a type of Jesus Christ. That was something that they had to do in the Old Testament. But Jesus here, you know, he's telling them that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, asking ye shall receive that your joy might be full. This praying in Jesus' name wasn't something they had been doing before that time. They always had to go through a priest. But today, that is, that is not the case. That's not, that's not how we do it today. You know, this, and so this was, you know, this was, a, this was a new concept. This was a new thing. Uh, look what it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. John, the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, said, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Remember the Holy Spirit, he's going to approve the world of righteousness. Talking about Jesus Christ, pointing people to Jesus Christ. Later he tells them, hey, you're going to be able to ask things of the Father in my name. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ is our high priest. And there we now, we can pray to the Father, we can ask things of the Father, and we do it in the name of Jesus. We do it in His name or under His authority. He is the one that gives us access to the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we do. We have the Father now. Why? Because we have Jesus Christ. We get that through Him. And so we don't, we don't have an earthly priest anymore. I'm not a priest you don't call me father. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that. You don't come to me and confess, my sin, or confess your sins. You can do that directly to the father and he forgives you every time because you do it in the name of Jesus who paid for your sins. I haven't paid for your sins. I can't, I can't do that for you. You have to do that. Okay? We don't have a priest. I can preach a whole message. I've preached messages before on the priesthood of the believer. And thank God for that. Thank God that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our advocate. And so that's what he's talking about here when he's talking about going to the Father in my name. This isn't just, you know, this isn't this name it, claim it. Hey, now you guys got access to all those things you always wanted to get. No, this is a new thing. We now have access to God in Jesus' name. We can pray to Him. We can talk to them. We can have a relationship with Him because of Jesus Christ. So look at verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father Himself loveth you. Hey, when you, say, when you ask in my name... He says, I'm not going to pray the Father for you. I'm not going to do, it's not going to be like it was where, you know, you would go to the priest and the priest would take something to the Father. No, he hears you too. God can hear our prayers. We have that direct access to God. That's what he's talking about there. And he says, um, he says, for the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Why does God love us? Why does God hear us? 
How do we become His children? We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, uh, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto Him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Okay, He's speaking in Proverbs. Now we get this. We get what He's talking about here because we have 1 John chapter 2. Okay, But understand, they didn't have all things that we have yet. These things hadn't been revealed. He's speaking to them in Proverbs because it wasn't time yet. Okay, Jesus was still on earth. So the Holy Spirit had, had not come on them yet. They didn't need to know this yet. But boy, they wanted to. You know, and they're like, you know, please don't speak any Proverbs. Speak plainly. How many of us have ever said that when reading the Bible? You know, Lord, couldn't you have been a little more clear on this one right here? You know, why is that so hard to understand? Listen, sometimes God just wants us to trust Him. The, that, that's the amazing thing about this Bible. Everything's laid out, yet... It's laid out in a way where only those who are saved can understand some things. Only those who are right with God are going to be able to understand other things. I mean, the Holy Spirit's got to reveal things to you. That is an amazing thing about this book. None of us can write a book that would do that. We, we, we don't have that ability. Only the Word of God. Just proof again, this is not a book written by men. And listen, lost people would think that because they're not seeing the spiritual but those who do see the spiritual, those are those who are saved, those who believe. And you and I know, and we have no doubt, that this is not a book just written by men. This is no doubt the Word of God. No man could make this happen. Only God could do that. So verse uh, 30, Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee, by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. He doesn't say, we believe you, we believe you. Please, no more Proverbs. Just tell us plainly. Haven't we proved ourselves? Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, and ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So, you know, the disciples said they believed, but, you know, they didn't believe as much as they thought they did. Because Jesus said, do you believe? Hey, you're all going to get scattered from me. You're going to leave me by myself. Only the Father will be with me. You know, they didn't, they didn't believe as much as they thought they did. They didn't have as much faith as they thought they did. And Jesus, He wanted them to learn to have peace in Him. He said, in me ye shall have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. All right? And in the world we're always going to have tribulation. But in Christ we have peace. You know what that means? I mean, those of us who are saved, we have the peace that passes understanding. We know we're on the way to heaven. We know everything's good between us and God. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I have no fear. You know, we're, in our country today, we worry about, you know, is, is North Korea going to nuke us? You know, is ISIS going to do another attack? You know, I mean, what's going to happen to us next? We worry about those things from the world. Why? Because in the world we have tribulation. In the world we have war. We worry about things from our own government. You got to worry about things from your neighbors. You know, am I going to get robbed? Is somebody going to try to, you know, kill me? We have those things in the world, but in Christ, we have peace because Things are fine. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. You know, it's nice the countries that we're at peace with. You know, I'm thankful for countries that we don't have to worry about. You know, and many, but many people, do you realize in most religions today, people don't have peace with Christ? They can't figure out if they're saved or not. They don't know if they're all good. Most of the people we talk to when we're out soul winning, hey, do you know for sure if you died, you go to heaven? I'm not sure. They don't have peace. They have tribulation. They're always trying to be good enough to go to heaven and they're fighting this battle with their flesh, just trying to be good, trying to follow all the rules of the church and it's just constant turmoil. You know why? Because they've never just put their faith in Christ and therefore they're not, they don't have peace with Christ. We have peace with Christ when we just believe on Him, when we have faith in Him and when we trust His work. That's where peace comes from. And Jesus wanted the disciples to learn to just have peace in Him. Hey, just... Take comfort in the fact that no matter what you're going through in this world, and while the world hates you, and while the world's going to want to kill you, things are they're fine between me and you. And if the world kills you, and they're going to, you're going to be in heaven with me. 
And you know, if the world does kill you, it's because I let them. And if I don't want them to, they won't. And so you know what? We've got to learn that. How to have peace in Christ and take comfort in the fact, you know, no matter what's going on, I know things between me and the Lord are good. We're settled. I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. I know I'm right with God. Well, I might make other people mad at me while, you know, others might not like what we do. Hey, I know what the Bible says. Things are okay between me and God. I've got peace with them. Yeah, it's causing some battles here on this earth. It causes some battles with your friends. It causes battles with your family. It might cause you some battles with your co-workers or something. Living like a Christian. We're going to have battles and tribulations until Jesus comes back. We're going to have those things. But we can always take comfort in knowing whatever we're going through, I'm okay with God. And that's all that matters and that's all I care about. And... That's, that's what I'm looking for. And so in this chapter, Jesus is showing them two things. First, they're standing with the world. You're standing with the world. If you're, it st- it's, if you're right with God, it's going to stink. It's not going to be good. You're not going to be popular. And their standing in the world would always be terrible, but their standing with the Father was great. Why? Because of our advocate with the Father. Well, what about when we sin? If any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I love how it says that. If any man sin, what if I do bad? We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, that throws in the righteous. Why does it throw that in there right then? Well, because while we're not always so righteous, He always is righteous, and He's our advocate. We're getting into heaven on His work, not our work. We're getting into heaven on His righteousness, not our righteousness, and therefore Jesus Christ... Our advocate, he is he's what gets us into heaven. We have that priesthood of the believer now through Jesus Christ. We have his Holy Spirit, and we just need to just trust him day by day. Just make sure we're at peace with him. As long as things are good between us and God, no matter what this world throws our way, we can have peace. And you can only get that through Jesus Christ. So with that, let's all stand together.